Navigation. All right. Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and today we're having a look at a fascinating piece of mid-century aerial navigation equipment. Yes, a topic I have never covered before on this channel. What can I say? These are like Pokemon, gotta catch them all. This is an Air Mileage Unit, or AMU Mark I, also known as a Mickey Mouse Unit. And this was used during the Second World War and for several years afterwards aboard long-range aircraft such as the Avro Lancaster, the English Electric Canberra, and the V-Bombers, the Avro Vulcan, the Handley Page Victor, and the Vickers Valiant. And this allowed the navigator to track the aircraft's mileage through the air, as well as its position relative to its point of departure, by continuously measuring and integrating its true airspeed. And the way in which it does this is really quite clever, so I thought I'd have a look at that today. Now, before we get started, I do need to mention that this is part one of a two-part video. This originally would have been connected to a readout panel at the navigator station called an Air Position Indicator, or API. And while I don't have my hands on one of those right now, I am working on it, and as soon as I do have one, then I will produce the follow-up video. Anyway, Without further ado, let's get right into it. Now, to explain how this works, it's first necessary to discuss how airspeed is measured. So in the vast majority of aircraft, airspeed is measured using what's known as a pitot-static system. And this consists of two basic parts, a pitot tube, an open-ended tube facing into the airstream, and a static port, which is mounted flush either to the side of the aircraft's fuselage or the pitot tube itself. Now, the static port measures static or ambient pressure, while the pitot tube measures what's known as stagnation pressure, which is a combination of static pressure and the dynamic pressure produced by the aircraft's movement through the air. And subtracting static pressure from stagnation pressure yields dynamic pressure, which is directly proportional to airspeed via the following formula derived from Bernoulli's equation. Now, in a traditional airspeed indicator, the static port and the pitot tube are connected on either side of a flexible diaphragm attached to the instrument's indicator needle. So as the aircraft speed changes, the dynamic pressure changes relative to the static pressure, and the diaphragm moves back and forth, moving the needle. However, on its own, a pitot static system can only give what's known as indicated airspeed, or IAS, which does not take into account a number of factors. For example, the instrument error inherent to any physical piece of equipment, as well as position error, which is related to the fact that there is nowhere on an aircraft that you can mount a pitot tube where it will give consistent readings at all angles of attack. Correcting indicated airspeed for these factors yields calibrated airspeed, or CAS. But IAS and CAS both assume incompressible adiabatic flow at sea level and thus do not take into account the changes in ambient temperature and pressure encountered at different altitudes, nor the effects of compressibility at high Mach numbers. And correcting for these factors yields true airspeed, or TAS. Now, TAS is usually calculated using a handy flight computer like the Immortal E6B or Wizwheel, which I've also covered in a previous video, link in the description. However, having a navigator continuously perform this calculation in order to track an aircraft's progress through the air would be very cumbersome and inconvenient. And while you could potentially build an analog computer to continuously correct indicated airspeed for Mach number, pressure, and temperature in order to yield true airspeed, the AMU performs the same function in a much more elegant way. So, how this works is by balancing the stagnation pressure from the pitot tube against an artificial stagnation pressure produced by a motor-driven fan. And there's a feedback mechanism in here that continuously works to balance those two pressures. And when those pressures are balanced, then the speed of the motor is directly proportional to the true airspeed of the aircraft. And that is transmitted by a flexible shaft to the AMU where it is converted into air mileage and a position. Now, that's very simple in principle, but a lot goes into actually making this work in practice. So let's have a closer look at this and see exactly how it works. Right, so this unit was refurbished for the Royal Canadian Air Force in 1958 by Phoenix Engineered Products of Toronto, placed in storage, and never issued. Indeed, this came to me in a sealed cellophane bag with its original refurbishment tag and all these dust caps over the various connectors. This is about as mint condition as it gets. As you can see, this mounting bracket features a set of rubber isolators to protect the unit from excessive vibration. On the top, we have a central cover for the electric motor that drives the internal fan. 
as well as covers for two vacuum tubes or valves, which are part of a feedback system that regulates the speed of the motor. Here we have two electrical connectors. The two pin connector supplies electrical power to the motor, while the five pin connector transmits the speed of the motor electrically to an instrument called the air mileage indicator or AMI. This mechanism uses a rotating cam geared to the motor to rapidly close a switch, generating a series of electrical pulses that are counted by the AMI. This is very similar to contemporary rotary phone technology, and if you want to learn more about that, I also have a video on the subject. Link is always in the description. These two pneumatic connectors are for pitot and static pressure. Now, static pressure is not drawn from the aircraft's regular static port, but rather a dedicated static vent installed specifically to supply this instrument. And these two larger pneumatic connectors are for cooling air. See, when static air enters the fan and is compressed, it heats up. As this would result in faulty readings, the whole unit has to be cooled by ambient air flowing through this duct. Finally, this mechanical connector is for a flexible rotating shaft that connects the AMU to the API at the navigator station. And this is geared such that 24 rotations of the shaft equals one nautical mile of travel. Later, the shaft was replaced by an electrical repeater for use in pressurized aircraft, as it was easier to pass an electrical cable through a pressurized bulkhead than a hollow shaft. So to open this up and show you the internal components, I just need to remove these four screws around the outside, and the outer sheet metal cover slides right off. At the bottom here, we have a set of capacitors, as well as an electromagnetic relay and some resistors, which along with the vacuum tubes are part of the feedback circuit that regulates the speed of the fan motor. You can also see the tubes leading from the pitot tube and static port connectors. Pitot pressure is fed into this top compartment, while static pressure is fed into the central compartment as well as into the fan, where it is compressed and fed through this tube into the lower compartment. Now if I undo these screws, I can separate this into two modules. In the lower module, we have two diaphragms, an upper low-speed diaphragm and a lower high-speed diaphragm, which is divided into two segments of unequal surface area. However, it's much easier to explain why this is and how this whole section works using a cutaway diagram, so we'll get to that in a second. For now, what's important to note is these electrical contacts on both diaphragms, which are connected to the motor circuit and help regulate its speed. And if we turn to the top module and remove this phenolic plate, we find our fan. Unfortunately, I can't disassemble this any further without damaging it, but this is a fairly standard centrifugal fan. Air enters at the center, gets pushed to the outside, and is tapped off by a scoop connected to this hose and conveyed to the lower compartment. Right, so to show you how this all works, let's have a look at a cross-section diagram. Here we can see our fan surrounded by the cooling plenum and our upper low speed and lower high speed diaphragms, which divides the internal space into three compartments. Pitot pressure is fed into the upper compartment, static pressure into the middle, and fan pressure into the lower compartment. Now the upper low speed diaphragm prevents the AMU and API from operating and producing spurious readings while the aircraft is taxiing on the ground. The attached contacts sit between the fan motor and its power supply and are normally open. Now when the aircraft makes its takeoff run and reaches an airspeed of 50 to 70 knots, the diaphragm is deflected and the contacts close, turning on the motor and activating the AMU. And so long as the aircraft remains above this airspeed, the whole system will continue to operate. However, from this point on, the system is controlled by the lower high-speed diaphragm. And to explain how that works, let's look at a simplified diagram. So once the system starts up, power to the motor passes through this bank of resistors, limiting its maximum speed. As the aircraft accelerates, the pitot pressure in this upper compartment increases, deflecting the diaphragm until the electrical contact closes. This, via the vacuum tubes and electromechanical relay, closes a set of normally open contacts that short out the resistor, supplying full power to the motor and causing the fan to accelerate. Eventually, the fan pressure counters the pitot pressure and the contacts reopen reconnecting the resistors and limiting the fan speed. This creates a negative feedback loop causing the motor speed to hover around an equilibrium point proportional to the true airspeed of the aircraft. This speed, as mentioned before, is transmitted to the API via a flexible rotating shaft. Now, that's the basic operating principle, but there are a couple more design details worth pointing out. For example, as I mentioned previously, the high-speed diaphragm is divided into two sections of unequal surface area. This was done to keep the size and power requirements of the AMU within reasonable limits. 
See, if the pitot and fan pressure were balanced at a 1 to 1 ratio, the fan blade tip speed would have to match the airspeed of the aircraft, and at higher speeds this would require either a very powerful motor or a very large fan. So instead, the two pressures are balanced at a fixed ratio by having the pitot pressure act against a smaller surface area and the fan pressure against a larger surface area. Another problem the designers had to account for was the effects of compressibility at higher speeds. See, at higher air speeds, air entering the pitot tube heats up due to compression, and this can potentially lead to inaccurately high pitot pressures and air speed readings. And while normally heating is compensated for by the cooling ducts, at high air speeds, the air passing through these ducts is also compressed and heated, so this doesn't work. Instead, the high-speed diaphragm on the Mark I AMU is fitted with a compensation mechanism in the form of a slided weighting balance beam that is adjusted prior to the unit being installed. This applies counter-pressure to the diaphragm at higher air speeds, compensating for artificially high pitot pressures. On the Mark II, III, and IV AMUs, however, this problem was addressed by fitting the fan blade with spring-loaded tips that extended under centrifugal force at higher air speeds, producing higher counter-pressure. There were also a number of other differences between the Mark I AMU and later versions. For example, while the Mark I was designed to operate at altitudes of up to 30,000 feet and air speeds of up to 300 knots, the Mark II, III, and IV could go up to 40,000 feet and 400 knots. The Mark III also had a slightly different wiring scheme to its motor regulation system, where the tubes had to warm up before power could be supplied to the field coils of the motor. And also, instead of a flexible shaft, it was fitted with a DC generator whose voltage output was directly proportional to the airspeed of the aircraft. Now, in the early 1960s, the RAF started to replace the various versions of the AMU with something called a True Airspeed Unit, or TAU. And this was designed to operate at the higher airspeed being flown by jet aircraft. And it calculated true airspeed from Mach number and local speed of sound. But to do this, it incorporated a very complex and very clever mechanical analog computer, and is thus far beyond the scope of this video, though I guarantee you if I ever get my hands on a TAU, I will definitely cover it in its own separate video on this channel. And anyway, that is how an AMU Mark I works. I hope you found that interesting. I actually hadn't heard of these things before my good friend at 17 Wing Heritage, Mr. Gord Crossley, handed me one along with this manual here, which explains how it works. This is just an absolutely fascinating and really clever piece of tech, and I can't wait to get my hands on the Associated Air Position Indicator, or API, and have a closer look at that in a separate video. But until then, thank you so much for watching. I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.